My name is Dave Bichelia. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a games company called The Tap Lab. And we're actually based right down the street here in Kendall. Um, we're a nine-person team. We've been making mobile games for the last four or five years. Um, and you know, our focus is making games that take full, or mobile games, uh, that take full advantage of the platform. Um, so that's using all of the sensors, you know, the GPS, the gyroscope, the accelerometer to create entirely new experiences for our players. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you guys about some universal design lessons uh, you know, that I've picked up during my career. And our first lesson today is that there's no such thing as universal design lessons. Uh, the great, great response, it depends uh, really on which game you're making, which genre you're focusing on. Um, but all of these principles that we're going to go over today um, are good to know if you're a game designer, and hopefully most of them can be applied moving forward. Uh, one, one last disclaimer, uh, I live and breathe mobile games, so most of the examples I give today will be mobile games, um, but a lot of these lessons can be applied to console, online, and even board games. So I'm going to structure this talk um, in line with the development cycle. So starting off with ideation, coming up with your game concepts, onto prototyping, building, testing, so that's your alpha, your beta, polish, and then hopefully, if all goes well, you'll eventually launch your game and go into growth mode. So we'll start off with ideation. Um, you know, focusing on divergent thinking um, will result in better ideas. That's something that you know, we all hear over and over again. Um, but I'd like to give you some ideas in terms of how to practice that. Um, so you know, start by encouraging your team to come up with ideas on their own and then bring all of those ideas together. Starting with a big kind of um, powwow with everyone around a table, it will kind of force some folks to not bring great ideas to the table. Designing a simple version to be prototyped is incredibly important. Uh, so you have to control for feature creep, you have to control the scope of your project, um, and you have to define the smallest unit of fun. Um, so you know, start by defining a core game loop. Very often people will just have this open discussion, we'll just start talking about the theme, they'll start talking about what's happening in level 59 when you're you know, going against all these other players in this massively multiplayer world. Try to boil it down to that core game loop. Figure out what your core mechanic is and how players are going to interact with that. Um, also come up with a couple variations of that core mechanic for prototyping. Um, and be sure to designate your scope police. This is an important one. Um, you know, very often the scope police end up being your engineers because uh, they can very quickly understand how much work is going to go into building those things. Um, but set that up from day one uh, so you've got that under control. Uh, the last bit here under ideation is you really have to love your game. Um, you know, uh, anyone who's built a game before, you know that passion is required to kind of endure the trials and tribulations of game development. Um, in terms of defining the game you're going to build, um, there's one thing that I've used in the past, and um, uh, actually uh, Christian Siegerstrahl, who was the uh, uh, founder of um, uh, Playfish, uh, was acquired by EA, a fantastic uh, games guy, um, gave this recommendation as well. To draw a circle on a board and put in all the types of games that you want to play in that circle. And then draw another circle, which is what you think the market actually wants to play. See where they overlap, and if you focus there, you're much more likely to come across a hit. Um, I thought that was a kind of interesting way of putting it. So once you've ironed out your game concept and defined the core mechanics, then you move on to the prototyping phase. Um, before you commit to a game mechanic, you have to prototype multiple variations of that mechanic and kill the unfun concept very quickly and focus on finding fun from the outset. So here's a couple screenshots um, from our, our buddies at Alchemy Labs. Um, these are some, uh, some prototypes they did for their game Jack Lumber. Uh, we see you know, that they tested uh, chopping a tree down from side to side, splitting logs that are being handed to you by a bear, um, you've got down here a chainsaw that's cutting through a tree and you have to avoid knots. Um, they've even got a uh, conveyor belt on which logs are coming out for you to split. Um, if you look real closely, you'll see this hilarious bear that's in a dump truck. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, it just took a long time for them to identify the mechanic that was truly fun. And you know, so often people make the mistake of saying, oh, I want to build this game. They'll do a paper prototype and say, this is going to be fun. And then they'll spend six months building it launch it, and it sucks. Don't do that. You can ideate, and then you can prototype to fun. Um, and it took these guys a while, but they found a mechanic that was truly fun. Uh, for any of you guys who play Jack Lumber, you know, you're basically drawing a path through these logs to chop them. 
Um, it's a truly fun mechanic. It resonated with their players, it resonated with the press, and um, it did really well. Um, the next thing here, this is actually a bunch of um, uh, sketches and concept art from our game, Bigfoot Hunter. Uh, during prototyping, do not be a perfectionist in terms of the art. Be sure to use placeholders. So we actually will take these sketches, cut them out, put them in the game, and use those um, to test the core mechanics. Uh, it's just, you know, you're going to save yourself a big headache, and also you're going to save your uh, artists a big headache. Uh, we made this mistake in the past where, you know, we'll overcommit to a, uh, a mechanic or a feature, uh, design final artwork with it, spend like, you know, one or two sprints on the artwork, and then realize that the mechanic or the feature just doesn't fit. We'll have to scrap all that artwork. Um, so, you know, save yourself the headache and use placeholder art for prototyping. Um, this is important. Get feedback as soon as possible. Um, this is actually us in the room right over <laughs> here um, at the Games Forum playtest. And uh, this is a uh, complete stranger we've never met before, uh, playtesting our game and giving us feedback. Um, you should be doing this during the prototyping phase. Um, don't wait until you've got a polished game. Uh, you've got nothing to hide, only things to learn. Um, some quick uh, tips here. Uh, in terms of uh, running these playtests, blind playtesting is key. Uh, so don't just show it to your mom and see if she likes it. Uh, go find complete strangers, have them test it. Don't tell them anything about the game. Ask them to speak openly and ask them to speak out loud and don't answer any of their questions. It can get pretty awkward, but that's when you get those <laughs> magical moments. Um, and the other thing is finding playtesters, right? That there's a few ways. I mean, I actually, whenever I'm on the tee and I see someone who's just twiddling their thumbs, I'll just say, like, hey, you want to check out the game I made? Um, usually people will grab your phone and play it. Um, although they'll probably be nice to you um, because you say, the game I made. Um, you can frame it in different ways. You can say, hey, you know, uh, my brother's going to quit his job to work on this game. I don't really get it. What do you think? Um, <laughs> that works. Um, or you can even say, hey, I'm doing research for this games company. Um, we're just trying to figure out if this game's going to be fun. Let me know what you think. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You know, be honest. Um, another thing is, we, we call it the Starbucks approach. Uh, there's a Starbucks right across the street from our uh, office. And we'll walk over there and we'll walk up to people sitting and say, hey, we'll buy you your next drink if you test our game. And no one has ever told us no. Um, and, you know, again, you have to lead the conversation with, you know, something that'll make, make it clear that they're not going to hurt your feelings when they give you feedback. Um, but get out there and get play testers. Um, and it, it's just invaluable during the prototyping phase to really validate your concepts. Uh, so, yeah, once you've got, you know, your core mechanic defined, uh, that's when you're you know, ready to kind of move on and start building the complete game. Uh, now, here, here's the first lesson during building. Whenever possible, show, don't tell. Honey uh, Wings here is a great example of um, you know, using very intuitive iconography to teach a lesson. Um, and in their tutorial, um, they literally just have this finger that pops up that shows you when to tap to get you into that core mechanic, and then you're off to the races and you're good to go. Um, and then you're trying to teach those mechanics as soon as possible and getting people right into the fun. Now, here's an important thing. Guided gameplay continues beyond the tutorial. Um, so you have to give constant feedback to drive home those core mechanics and keep players engaged. Uh, you know, Guitar Hero 3, this is uh, Legends of Rock. Um, you know, they've got the rock meter there. As you're playing the game, you're seeing those notes explode. You know when you make a, mis a mistake because of that constant feedback, and it keeps you engaged over the long term. Another thing is, you know, don't underestimate the value of short-term goals. Very often when we're kind of building out a progression, we're thinking about the longer-term goal uh, of the gameplay. Uh, but if you look at Jetpack Joyride, I mean, they've got these mini missions. Uh, they're little achievements, but they're meaningful achievements that a player can um, access each and every session. Um, it's also important to introduce these new mechanics and features gradually. Uh, throughout the progression. You know, otherwise, you run the risk of kind of overwhelming your players with too many options up front. And uh, you know, here I have the, the HUD, the heads-up display from Cl Clash of Clans. Um, and you'll notice, you know, during the tutorial you have three resources. Um, but as you progress, more and more elements are introduced. And, you know, the cool part about it is you actually feel like you're accomplishing something as you're getting access to those new mechanics. Um, you know, as we see here, you know, showing that visible progress is extremely important. Um, you know, it's a way to reward your players as they're progressing. Um, and you know, it, it comes in many forms. It can be upgrading your character in WoW, you know, like bigger shoulder pads, uh, you know, building out your city in SimCity, um, or even building out your village um, in Clash of Clans. Um, or 
finding a way to let your players kind of express themselves is really what it comes down to. Um, you think about it like Minecraft, right? Like the crazy creations people come up with, showing those off, that's what draws people to the game. And also they get that sense of ownership where they come back to it because they've left their footprint in the world. Um, and you know, the other thing I'd throw out there is this isn't just for the player. It can be a very powerful tool to show new players what they have to aspire to. So Clash of Clans does a great job of when new players enter, they'll actually show you other players, later stage players, villages, and you see, okay, I can be like that. I know what I have to aspire to. Uh, it's very powerful, and many other games are doing that now, and um, it's, it's great for that long-term retention. Um, but once you've got the game ready to go, it's, it's time to um, test it with a larger group of folks. And this would be kind of your alpha and your beta testing phase. So you know, metrics really do matter. Um, and, and using analytics services like Mixpanel or Localytics, actually these guys are based right here in Boston, and we've been using them for a while. Um, it's just um, a great way to make sure you're on the right track. Um, you, know, you should know your industry benchmarks, be attentive, and, and really set the objectives for your, uh, for your game from the outset. Uh, key metrics you should focus on are like engagement, uh, retention, monetization, and virality. For engagement, that's you know session frequency and session duration, um, and that's really kind of the lifeblood of your game. It's like okay, how long are people playing the game, and how often are they coming back? That really defines how fun the experience is and how successful it can be. Um, in terms of you know retention, we're talking mainly about in mobile, day one, day seven, and day thirty retention. So that's how many people come back the day after they've installed the game to play again, the week after, and the month after. Um, now, there's benchmarks for different categories of games, so more hardcore games will have higher retention or lower retention than the more casual games, um, and vice versa for monetization. Um, in terms of monetization, the type of, uh, you know, key metrics you're looking at are percent paying, so that's what percentage of your players are actually monetizing and then your average revenue per daily active user. Um, and again, if you guys want to really get into the weeds on these, I'm happy to you know, uh, talk about our experience with using, using Localytics, give you guys some industry benchmarks based on the types of games you're creating. Now, here's something that most folks figure out or find out the hard way. It's that your first time user experience, for two, your, your tutorial and what happens afterwards, um, is the most important part of your game and you're going to spend more time on this one part of your game than the rest of it. Um, the reason why is because if your tutorial sucks, they're not going to come back to play the rest of the game. Um, and you know, this is Cut the Rope. They do a fantastic job. It's incredibly intuitive. It's incredibly simple. You get the gameplay. Um, you know, we spent a ton of time on our first time user experience in Tiny Tycoons. Uh, you know, it started off, um, we had like a 50% completion rate, so 50% of people that downloaded the game completed the tutorial. In mobile, your target is like 80% completion rate or higher. It took us a month of iterating on that tutorial to get it over 80%, but we got it there. And we did it by using those metrics and really keeping a close eye on it. Um, so pro tips is just, you know, so many games make the mistake of having a registration process where you download the game and it's like, sign up, give us your email, give us you know, Facebook access. Don't do that, get straight to the fun. Um, you know, don't make them dig through a bunch of menus to get into the core experience. Drop them directly into it the moment after that game loads. Now, optimizing monetization. Uh, you need to put a lot of thought into how you monetize your games. Uh, for free-to-play games, it's important to make these in-app purchases as easy as possible. Um, you know, one of the things that we learned was do not hide your purchases in the shop. You should actually integrate them into gameplay when the player needs them so they understand the value of that purchase. Uh, Temple, done, uh, Temple Run does a great job with this. Um, the idea is you know, when, you, when you fail, you have the option to save yourself with a gem. And if you don't have enough gems, you know, they say, hey, you don't have enough gems, you have the option to either buy more gems or you can uh, get more gems for free. Um, another important point here is don't act on single data points. Um, you know, very often you'll be in a play, to t uh, you know, play test and someone will say something about your game like, you know, they don't like this feature or you have to do this. And you have this tendency deep down inside to be like, everyone's going to want that or everyone's not going to like this. I'm going to focus on building that in. Um, don't rush. You should wait to identify trends um, and uh, 
you know, significant amount of folks asking for the same thing before you act on that feedback. Um, you know, another thing that I would throw out there is um, with metrics, uh, so once you actually start collecting real data on your players, um, a lot of folks, you know, they'll get a couple hundred people in and they'll be like, oh, you know, we're looking at our retention and it's great. And then once you actually start reaching scale, you realize that none of that data was statistically significant um, and you were basing your decisions off of just kind of fluff. Um, you know, a benchmark that we rely on in mobile uh, is you need like 3,000 daily active users sustained over a, a period of time to have statistically significant monetization data. And for your you know, retention and engagement, like 1,000 users plus sustained over a long period of time, that's when you can be really confident that those numbers will hold true at scale. So you've completed the alpha, the beta, uh, your game's feature complete, now you're moving into the polish phase. Um, you know, an interesting thing here, uh, a, a lot of developers, you'll see this in mobile, uh, will do a geo-targeted soft launch of their game. And that's actually, you go into the App Store and you check off um, one or, or two or three um, specific countries you want to launch your game in. They're usually English-speaking countries if you're targeting the U.S. So for us, it's Canada. Um, many folks will launch their games in Australia or Ireland. And the idea here is you're able to um, get your game live in the marketplace, you're able to test monetization and get to greater scale faster. And you can also test your user acquisition. Um, the other thing would be to surprise your players whenever possible. Monument Valley, they continually introduce new puzzles that kind of catch you by surprise. Game, uh, puzzles you wouldn't expect. Um, you can also achieve surprise through, you know, twists in core mechanics, um, through twists in the narrative, and, and even through, like, secrets, like secret levels, like the, uh, the cloud level in, uh, in Mario. The next thing I would say is balance everything. Um, you know, you're going to want to balance your economy, you're going to want to balance, um, you know, your, your gameplay, the competition, um, all of your resources, and be sure to cap all of your resources. Uh, the example I'm using here is actually the first game I ever made, um, it's called Duality, um, it was horribly balanced, uh, but the game is basically risk in the real world. We used Google Maps, we were using real people and places as the pieces of the game, and we actually launched it at Boston University while we were at school there. Um, and the campus turned into a war zone overnight. Uh, we had students, you know, claiming ownership of properties, driving around in their cars and like attacking places. Um, but we had absolutely no limits on resources and absolutely no limits on, on um, you know, the gameplay. And as a result, like properties were changing hands so quickly that players didn't even know if they actually got it or not because they'd buy it and then like three seconds later someone else would buy it. The, the value of these properties went from like 10 coins to like billions of coins overnight. Um, and there were, you know, it was fun for a moment and then you realize how poorly balanced it was and it, you know, we kind of had it, all right, we're gonna scrap this and, and start from scratch. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's one thing to keep in mind throughout the process, but during this polishing phase, this is when you really tweak it, refine it, and get it ready to launch. Um, then if everything goes according to plan, uh, you know, you'll finally launch your game. And, uh, you know, if that launch goes well, uh, then you'll dig into growth mode. The important thing here uh, is, you know, you want to uh, create a game that sells itself. Uh, one of our advisors, Jesse Shell, talks about uh, how games should be kind of these story machines. Um, and, you know, a great example here uh, is a game like Flappy Bird, where, you know, every player felt compelled to share their, their score. Um, and the designer just made it incredibly easy for you to share that score. I mean, he knew that that was the core story. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, that extends all the way to games like Battlefield, where some player does some, like, ridiculous maneuver, films it, posts it on YouTube, and gets a million uh, clicks overnight. Um, you know, it's something that uh, is so important, especially now when user acquisition costs are just skyrocketing. You need to make a game that sells itself. Um, content is so important post-launch, especially in a free-to-play game, uh, in terms of keeping your players engaged. So this is CSR Racing. They do a great job of releasing content regularly. Uh, so new cars, new races. Um, and it's just a way to, um, you know, keep the players that have already kind of grinded through a lot of your content engaged, keep them looking forward to new content. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we learned in Tiny Tycoons, 
um, it does have a huge impact in pulling your players back into the experience. So we launched like new feature destinations, new property types, even like hilarious avatar updates. We'll do a push notification to our players and tell them, hey, you can dress up as a Viking in the game now, and you'll see a pretty good return um, on, on that investment. Um, so the last thing um, is, you know, as you grow your user base, you'll get more and more data coming in. And this is actually a, a quote from one of our, uh, our advisors and good friends, Nabil Hyatt. Um, over at Spark, uh, is metrics are people too. Um, so it's so easy to just get blinded by metrics and, and analytics. Um, you know, it's really important to remember to incorporate your player feedback into that decision making process. Um, and you know, the other thing is, very often folks will look at this and say, okay, we need to increase our percent paying. They'll do a sale and see their percent paying goes up, not realizing that they're just spoiling um, the economy or that you know, they're teaching players to wait for sales uh, to make purchases. Um, so be sure to consider your player, talk to your players, and continue to read their feedback throughout the uh, um, development process. Uh, and last thing is if your game does really, really well, um, you'll want to expand globally. Um, so you keep localization in mind. Um, whenever possible, don't bake text into assets. Uh, that'll make localization so difficult further down the road. Um, you try to use in intuitive uh, iconography as much as possible. Um, and understand that these design paradigms, they really vary from one market to the other. Um, and you know, to be successful in a foreign market, you may actually have to team up with a local publisher um, and work with them to make sure that all your design mechanics um, you know, kind of carry over well. Um, and that's actually a great transition to my last point here. Um, it's that you know, there really is no such thing as universal game design but you know, hopefully some of these will be useful to you guys as you build your games. So uh, I'll open it up to uh, Q&A, and uh, thank you very much.